Today we're going to be rewinding the clock a little bit and going back to about 20 years or so in the past. Today we're going to be looking at something that shaped and revolutionized portable gaming. No, yeah, we had the Game Boy and the DS, but this one kind of revolutionized it and made it a little bit better. The Sony PlayStation Portable. Click it. Now when the PSP hit the United States in 2005, it was a complete game trainer. Sony's new handheld was not just a competitor to the Nintendo DS, but a powerhouse that brought console quality games to our pocket. Now the Sony PlayStation Portable first initially released in Japan in 2004, and then the following year in the United States in 2005. With the success of the PlayStation 2, Sony thinking, oh, how can I top this? Especially with the high demand for mobile gaming at the time. They tried to think of a device that would deliver a console-like experience on the go. It boasted an amazing 4.3 inch TFT LCD screen, impressive graphics at its time, and multimedia capabilities, including music, video playback, web browser, and Wi-Fi connectivity. That just made it even more than just a gaming device. And a 330 megawatts CPU and 32 gigs of RAM. All in all, this was just a mini PS2 in your pocket. And watch out for the Wi-Fi thing. Since we're in 2024, I did a lot of a little bit of research, and you can't actually connect this to the internet unless you really dumb down your security on your Wi-Fi router, and that does not make any sense. And there's really no reason to do that. Seeing how you can get the games for cheap as hell, there's really no point to connect to the internet on this thing. And that was one of the main things I did when I first got it to try to connect to the Wi-Fi, see if it was up to date, and all that stuff. And no, it's just our Wi-Fi now in 2024 is too strong. Sony promised a lot of quality console games for this handheld. And by the end of its life cycle, it actually delivered more than it promised. Now the PSP launched with a ton of games. It had a huge lineup when it, when it officially launched. It had games like Loomis, Ridge Racer, Wipeout Pure. Some of the most groundbreaking games for the PSP included God of War Change of Olympics, The Grand Theft Autos, Liberty City, and Vice City Stories, Metal Gear Solid, Peace Walker. These games pushed the boundaries of what a handheld console could do. And Nintendo was doing nothing like this at the time, so it made it a lot more impressive when Sony did it. Another cool thing about the PSP is that it had four major revisions. The 1000, the 2000, the 3000, and the PSP Go. And there's also a lesser known cousin, the PSP E1000, nicknamed the PSP Street. I didn't know anything about this until I actually did some research for this video, but the E1000 had a softer texture and color giving it a matte black look and a more rounded edge design. See I was actually in love with the PSP so I'm actually surprised that this flew under the radar for me. It came out around 2011 and I was heavily into gaming at the time so I'm not sure how I missed it. Perhaps because it didn't come out in the United States and I was 15 at the time. I also heard that it had a cheap feel to it and from what I heard it lacked a few things but would still love to get my hands on it one day. But the E1000 was basically the definitive edition of the console because it was the last version besides the PSP Go and we all know how that went. Software wise, there wasn't much difference from the Go. The charging method was a little different and didn't have a Wi-Fi capabilities. However, the PSP wasn't really about online gameplay. The internet browser was terrible throughout the entire system's life. Almost every game supported online play, but its quality varied game by game. Overall, it wasn't good. The PlayStation Store worked. The PlayStation Store worked, and I was fine with that. The PS3 connectivity was fantastic. You can even, in theory, play your PS3 games on the PSP, which was revolutionary at the time. Some games, of course, weren't compatible, and that makes sense because a lot of PS3 games were actually pretty large and way past the capacity for the PSP to handle. See, I never experienced remote play because I never actually had a PS3. I was an Xbox 360 kid, but I'm not sure even if I would use it if I had a PS3 because why go from playing a great game on a PS3 with a full controller to a smaller screen with a single joystick that was terrible to use? That just doesn't make sense to me, but to each his own. One really cool feature I actually liked about the PSP is if you actually didn't have a memory card for your game and you didn't want to like restart everything every single time, all you had to do was press the power button up once and it would just go to a sleep mode basically and then just press it up again and your game would pop up exactly where you left off at. And I actually really like that. Now though the production of the PSP ended in 2014, the legacy lives on. It was more than just a gaming device, it was a multimedia powerhouse. It was truly ahead of its time, it just really was. But yeah, if you're on a nostalgia kick, I'd say 100%. If you can find one for a good price that, that you're willing to pay, I'd say go for it. It's a good device and it's a good game to have. It's a good system to have. 
So what do you guys think about the PSP in 2024? Do you think it's worth it or not? Let me know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll catch you on the next one. No. So what do y'all think about the PSP in 2024? Do you think it's worth it? Waste of money? Or is it a cash grab? Or is it something? So what do y'all think about the Sony PSP in 2024? Do you think it's worth it or not? Let me know in the comments down below. Um, until then, I'm going to go play me some motherfucking PSP. Peace. Oh, cool.